one. Okay, right. Um, I tell you what, it's very relaxing when Anne's not telling us about those washing machines. So, Jess, what do you know about the Greenland Vikings? Um, not too much, really. Okay. Um, I have, I have learned things about the Vikings. Um, I went to York quite recently and saw a lot of um, like archaeology of Vikings in York, but I don't really know much about the Greenland Vikings. Okay, to be honest. That's, that's fair enough. Uh, what about what about you, wonderful Drina? Um, they landed. They were looking for, um, I don't know, a pleasant place to live. I think they got thrown out, did they? And they landed and they stayed there quite a long time and then they just disappeared, died out. Right, okay. Um, as we go on to the break now, uh, that was a really good lecture. <laughs> You've actually done my beginning, my middle and the end, both of you. So now, the one thing that I would say about the green land vikings is that there's so much to be said about them and um and i've got to be honest with you my lecture this morning ran over by half an hour um and the one on tuesday ran over by half an hour so um i'm gonna try and at least do this in um under two hours i'm really praying and hoping i can do that um but the greenland vikings themselves come into a moment in history that has one or two parallels on today's world um that comes out and i would like to start off with saying that the figure in front of you is carved from walrus ivory and walrus ivory was the main export of those people from greenland and we do show you a map of where everything is in a short while and with that said when I mention the Greenland Vikings to people, they, they always either say that it was a place that people were there for a short period of time or were there for a few hundred years. And one thing that Drina said, completely correct, is that um, the people on Greenland completely disappeared. It's very much linked with great moments in our history and one or two figures in our history as well. And when I say our history, I think that's going to be the accepted norm from now on in the present times that we live in. If any have ever heard of the Lewis chess pieces, they will not be aware that the Lewis chess pieces found in Scotland in the 1800s on the Isle of Lewis are actually carved out of walrus ivory from Greenland. So straight away, we've got an idea of Greenland being um, the hub and the home of a great network of trade. Moving on to the next image. The good thing about Greenland is that lots of the things that we, we think about as archaeologists about Greenland, and lots of the things that historians say about Greenland, because of the archaeological excavations there, can actually be proved or disproved. And throughout this talk, I go back and forth. I, I, I go through to today, I go back to a thousand years ago, and I come forward and I keep going back and forth because that's the nature of the story about Greenland. There's no order to it. Archaeologists working in Greenland today, another key fact, will be aware that they're working through permafrost. And you start to think, permafrost, this is a thousand years on, and they're working on a landscape that once was rich as an agricultural landscape was a landscape where cattle and sheep would graze be a landscape that they built churches it'd be a landscape that they traded from um, it was a very rich landscape and then suddenly not really suddenly but within about 300 years the landscape had been exhausted and everything that we know about greenland like the lecture about Pablo Benito, and I've not planned any of these lectures, um, has a great learning curve that we can learn from for today. Uh, we can avoid the next outbreak of the pandemic if we can learn from the morals of the past. But this is humanity, we don't learn. We keep doing stupid things. Enough of my soapbox. 
But before we go any further, this is text. This is associated with all those sagas that I learned about when I was a child. And those sagas were read to me whilst I was lying in bed by Magnus Magnusson. I had a radio and I used to get tapes from the Barry Library. And I used to listen to Magnus Magnusson tell me about the sagas from his land, Iceland. And some of those sagas took us to Norway. Some of those sagas took us to Iceland, Britain. And some of those sagas took us all the way to Greenland itself. Figures that we will come across are Leif Erikson and Eric the Red. And one thing, um, and you've raised your hand, Jessica, is there anything you'd like to say? Um, yeah, in relation to, uh, you mentioned Greenland, Iceland, etc. with the Vikings. Um, I've just looked on JSTOR now as you were talking. Um, they're free at the moment for the pandemic. So you can look at any article that's... Um, academic really and they have um an article here on vital viking settlements in iceland and greenland and the danish arctic as well which i think it could be a good read yes and and i do believe that um one of the articles would, would be very close on to the mark that the one you've actually you're actually looking at and back yeah. to that that's today and back in the day as well with the document that you've got in front of you this is um, mm. this comes from um, one of the sagas. It's reprinted by an archaeologist um, known as Beamish in 1864, an antiquarian. And he, and the this this little quote here is actually from that. It's about Svadvold's expedition, and Svadvold's expedition um, could very much be talking about the people of Greenland. It goes as follows: Svadvold said in the saga. Here it is beautiful, and here would I like to raise my dwelling. Then went they to the ship, and saw upon the sands within the promontory three elevations, and went hither, and saw three skin boats, canoes, and three men under each. Then divided they their people, and caught them all except one, who got away with his boat. They killed the other eight, and then went back to the cape and looked round them, and saw some heights inside the firth, and supposed that these were dwellings. That's actually a description of um, the Skraelings. The Skraelings were the native peoples of Greenland, the Inuits. And it's thought throughout history that... The Skraelings may have been the people, the, those Inuits that led to the massacring of the Greenland Vikings. But lots of us archaeologists actually disagree with that. But those who write the history are those who have actually got the writing. So if we move on a little bit further, I would like to um, start off with my own academic article here that was um, printed from 2016. But before we do that, let's just uh, change the image that you've got in front of you. Just a moment. So that's so there are lots of sagas written about Iceland and Greenland. And as we look at that image, picture that image in your mind. Now, we're going to go back to the 1700s. So let's let's think of that image. And the title of this article is Why Did Greenland Vikings Disappear? And it goes as follows. Picture that image in, in your eye and look through from the other side, from the fjord beyond. In 1721, missionary Hans Eged sailed a ship called the Hope from Norway to Greenland, seeking Norse farmers whom Europeans hadn't heard from in 200 years in order to convert them to, to the Protestant faith. After all, 200 years earlier, they had been Catholic. So Hans was getting very keen on his journey. New Christians, not from, not from the Inuits, but Christians that were going to be converted to the new Christian faith. He eventually um, docked in Iceland, and then he eventually reached the coast of Greenland. And he explored the iceberg-dotted fjords that gave way to gentle valleys and silver lakes 
that shimmered below the massive ice cap. And as he looked, there was nothing to see. One day they reached the shore and in the distance there were structure like buildings. And along the shore was an Inuit hunter. He met with the Norseman and the Norseman was very curious about why he was seeing an Inuit. And the Inuit exclaimed, why are you here? And the missionary said, I have come to find Christians. And the Inuit uh, hunter said, I will take you to those Christians. So they, they went up a, a, a sort of semi-steep slope in a, a place known as Branhilid, which is on the south settlement of Viking Greenland. And he was shown the crumbling stone church walls. These were the only remnants of 500 years of occupation. He then wrote, what has been the fate of so many human beings so long cut off from all intercourse with the more civilized world? Where are they, he thought. He had come all that way to find them. After meeting with the Inuit, he then wrote, were they destroyed by an invasion of natives? And then he thought, I was greeted. I was welcomed. This is 1721. And then he stated the following. Did they perish by the inclemency of the climate? Which was a very wise statement to be making in 1721, when people were still unaware of climatic conditions. And then he wrote, did the population leave because of the sterility of the soil? Did they run out of natural resources? Did they overhunt? And all those questions have been made throughout the centuries. The building that you're actually looking at at the moment, and the building that you're looking at at the moment is at the southern settlement known as Bran Hillard. And years and years ago, when I was editor of Archaeology News Report, we actually covered this site. And it was a rather interesting um, article because um, there was fresh archaeological excavations going on uh, in this neck of the woods back in about 2002. The archaeologists refer to Greenland as the farm under the sand or the Greenland's Pompeii. And excavations have been undertaken there for around 100 years, exactly 100 years. The first work there was in the 1920s by Danish and Norwegian archaeologists. Those that know anything about Greenland will know that um, in 1814, Greenland became the, under, the protector, under the protectorate of the, the Danish king. In excavating these buildings, they've more or less found us all the information that we require. But some of the new information that I've got is actually from um, this article that I've just quoted out of. The archaeologists dug through the permafrost and removed the wind-blown glacial sand that filled the rooms. And they were co confused to find a wealth of archaeological data. And this was a wealth of archaeological data, you know, not just a few bits of broken pottery, but fairly well-preserved artifacts preserved in the permafrost. Evidence of looms and evidence of cloth as well. Scattered around, scattered around one of the rooms that they excavated in the 1990s were normal household belongings, including an iron knife, wet stones, soapstone, ves soapstone vessels, which is the type of thing that you'd find um, in Shetland, typical Viking vessel made out of a very soft stone, and even a double-edged comb. And then the archaeologists started to wonder why the abandonment of this archaeology. It's almost as if in, in one moment the building had been abandoned. Because as they were looking along amongst the artifacts, they found iron, 
and caribou antler tipped arrow shafts, arrows. They, 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 they thought this is a bit strange. Um, and why, why has it all been abandoned? Why, and, and in other words, they were coming directly back um, with the 1700s, where we've got that missionary going to Greenland and asking those very questions. It, it's, it's something quite strange here. The disappearance of the Greenlanders has intrigued students of history for centuries. And in fact, we know of the last person dying on Greenland who was of um, Viking stock in about 1540. And it's likely that that was the last person um, from 5,000, from a population of 5,000 people at the height of the Green Greenlandic um, peoples um, around um, 1100 years AD. And by 1540, the population had reduced down to one. But there was one person still there. And it bids the question, why didn't he die? If the, if the environment was so bad, why didn't he die? And, he, and there was no Inuits around either. But that's way at the end of this lecture. That's, that's the last paragraph that I, that I look at. It's been an old, an old source once said that the Greenlanders disappeared because of the fighting between them and the Inuit, the Skraelings. And it's said that the, um, the Skraelings had mig migrated south. But that other, that, other little, um, that other little source that I used indicated that the, the Inuits had always been around the Viking um, Greenlanders. So, you know, were they truly wiped out by a horde of people? The answer is likely um, that they weren't. There's, and then the archaeologists actually find us some real evidence to prove that that's not the case. So what I'd like to do now is looking through that window, out at the fjord, take away that building, take away that little white building in the distance as well, and think you're looking from the fjord into a really lush green landscape uh, with lots of trees, um, a landscape that is going to be um, very rich. There's various animals wandering around, caribou, all sorts of uh, different beasts. Um, and you've already passed those walruses. And you're looking at a very rich landscape. This is a thousand years ago. And then the story begins in the year 983. But let's look at another illustration. Keep that one in your mind. And here we go. Here's a map. You can't go wrong with a map. So the distance, the distance from Iceland to the, 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 the tip is about 700 miles, depending on where you go, 800 miles, 900 miles. But it's about a thousand miles from Iceland all the way to the Western settlement. So, you know, it's quite some distance. But Eric the Red, the story about Eric the Red, obviously you can read that up yourself. Um, there was some infighting associated with Eric the Red. He was told to leave. Um, he was said, like, go over there, go and play with the cr cricket stumps. And he ended up going to Greenland. And he thought, oh, wow, this is, this is a bit of a right. So anyway, I ended up going to Iceland. And he said, he said look, can I take um, people from Iceland to Greenland? And they set out in 24 boats. Rather interesting map, and um, and if anyone wants to, um, if anyone wants to actually go deeper into this, if anyone, um, the word Labrador, for example, means land, probably the frozen land, um, hence the Labrador Sea. Um, in in one source that I read, the the Norse settlements were divided into three zones. The southern settlement, known as the eastern settlement, the western settlement, known as the northern settlement, don't ask, um, and the middle settlement obviously speaks for itself, and there were a few little farms dotted in be between. Branhillid, the eastern settlement itself, uh, as I get my little annotations out, because Dal knows I like my annotations, that there, the eastern settlement, is the biggest of these settlements. 5,000 people spread um, amongst all these settlements. One thing that can equally be said is that we now have archaeological evidence all the way 
all the way up and down uh, North America, all the way further up north. Um, archaeological evidence associated with the Vikings, their trade items from, from coins all the way through to bits of chain mail, um, little bits of clasps from books, um, all the little trappings of um, Vic Viking technology. But all these have been found in other areas. Are they trade goods? Well, there's one thing that we do know. And I, I am told that there was a program on, um, on one of the channels last night about a, a Viking settlement in um, North mainland America. Um, are these the same Vikings that are associated with the Greenlanders? The answer is we don't know yet. But it's intriguing that that may answer what may have happened to the Greenland Vikings, but not the only answer. So, again, clear my screen. And if we do this, and we go to there, bingo. Now this is a rather, this tells me a few other things as well. Uh, the Norse um, colonists established settlements in southern Greenland. And this is the point, the rest of the land, the Inuits could go wherever they liked. Um, and if you're, if you're probably working this out, um, if you want to divide and conquer, you can sort of take a line that could be the territory for the Vikings, and then the Inuits have um, all of this. So, you know, why would the Inuits want to be fighting the Vikings? The answer is they're not going to want to because there's a lot of land for these people. And it's only when the people that are visiting North America, the likes of the, the uh, founding fathers on the Mayflower and so on, uh, and Cabot and all those other. Um, all those other expeditions from the late, from the late 14, 15, 1600s onwards, that there's actually real conflict. Now, the moral of this whole story to do with the Inuits and the Greenland um, Vikings, and I'm going to say it much earlier than I did with the other lectures, that um, there's a lot to be learnt. If I went to the end of this lecture, I would be saying that the Greenland Vikings should have learnt and cooperated with the Inuit sooner. They should have been able. To, they should have learnt how to survive. Um, they should have said us and not them, i.e., the word of cooperation. They should have learnt that the key point by exhausting out, by exhausting all your resources, as we are doing now, you're going to be you're going to be doomed to continue to make those mistakes over and over again. Now, if the, if the, um, if the founding fathers of North America had only looked towards what happened with the Greenland Vikings, they would have learned the following. One, when you land in a foreign land, the first thing you don't do is build a church. Two, you don't land in a foreign land and then exhaust all its resources. That's the second mistake. That's what the Vikings did here. And this is what the founding fathers did in North America. And that's why you come across many reports of Native Americans having to help Europeans in North America when they ex exhausted not, their, not only their own supplies, but all the supplies around them. You know, you hear about silly stories like the Native Americans saying, actually, uh, you've killed all your chickens, you've eaten all your chickens, you've eaten all your food, we've actually got turkeys, why don't you start eating them? I know it sounds silly, but um, they didn't learn from the Gr Greenland um, uh, Vikings, and we seem to repeat these same things over and over again. So, uh, there's another great moral in this whole story that we're going to come on to, but um, that's a little bit later. So clearing my little bits and notes, let's go back to uh, my own um, sources here. There's 24 boatloads of land-hungry settlers who set out from Iceland in the summer of 986 to colonize new territory explored several years earlier by the vagabond and outlaw Eric the Red. Well, this was only, that was only three years earlier when he went there, but Eric the Red was leading this expedition with his son, Lef Eriksson. Uh, now, these are these have got to be two of the most famous people uh, in the Scandinavian world. And we've got the evidence for them as well coming up. 
Only 14 of their vessels from, uh, that set out out of the 24 made it to Greenland. The others turned back, one or two capsized, that was it. And under the leadership of the red-bearded Eric the Red, they managed to colonize this landscape, the, the allure of this rich landscape. Now, you can go back and forth, you can argue one way or another why it's called Greenland. It's called Greenland because it was once a Greenland. It was also called Vinland, but people think that Vinland is actually uh, further south in, um, in North America, but it's given all these titles. Some people actually believe you could actually grow grapes there. So amazingly, after 300 years, there's a, there's a categoric collapse in the environment, not just in Greenland. Um, the year is 1315, and you have a collapse in temperature in the Western Hemisphere of not half a degree, but a whole one degree in temperature. And to give you an idea of the dramatic, dramatic effect that um, a rise of, uh, uh, start again, give you a dramatic effect um, of a fall in temperature of one degree um, is that um, you're going to have, um, you're going to have more and more land exposed, but you're going to have more and more ice. Um, the temperature in the summer months is going to be is going to absolutely plummet. Um, then, when temperature rises again by one degree, you can have excessive flooding. So, a change in temperature is has a massive effect on environments. So, a collapse in temperature from 1000 A.D. to 1315 of one degree has a has a dramatic effect on the colonists at Greenland, and they do not adapt to this. That dramatic effect is not only colder winters, but also excessive rainfall uh, in the summer months, meaning that crops fail, meaning that you don't have enough haylage for the winter, meaning that the animals are going to die over the winter months. This has a catastrophic effect. But the Greenland Vikings could have done something about it. The Inuits did something about it. After all, the Inuits are still there today. The Inuits still dominate that landscape. What did they do right that the Greenland Vikings didn't? Eric the Red reached North America. Um, well, Lef Erikson did 500 years before Columbus. And the big mistake that they made was to bring the Western world to Greenland. Another huge mistake. That's number three. Bringing your civilization to another world. Um, and if you want to look at today's problems, you can understand what the answer is. Um, integration. However, um, that's, that's another story. When you bring the Western world to Greenland, they expected that their dairy cattle and their sheep and their goats could graze untended on the unglaciated landscape unchecked. But somebody who keeps goats myself knows too well that goats soon exhaust the landscape and eat everything. And going back to the other mistakes that I made, I, I, I mentioned about one of the things that they instantly did was they started building churches. Now, hang on a minute, right? You're starting to build churches and you haven't even sown your crop. Um, and, um, and again, when we look at the Darien expedition, the Darien expedition is in the mid 1600s. It's a Scottish expedition to Panama, Central America, to create a colony. And the first thing that they did, instead of planting crops, was to build a castle, was to build a church. And then they realized they had no food um, for the following year. These are the same mistakes as human beings that we make all the time. We don't learn from our mistakes. They built a monastery, they built a nunnery, they built a cathedral. They even had bronze bells brought from, brought from Norway and Iceland to put in their cathedral for Pete's sake, instead of having sacks of grain brought out from Norway. They even had imported greenish tinted glass windows. And in bringing all those goods in, they exhausted their own resources. Because this is, again, you create something, it goes out, and you have some... So in other words, um, you're, a, you're a dairy farmer, right? You sell all your milk, 
And then your children turn around and say, Daddy, can I have some milk? And the farmer says, no, I've sold it all. This, this, is what, this is what was happening with the people of Greenland. All their resources were going out of the country and they were importing in stupid things like bells and tinted glass and building material for Pete's sake. Is, is ballast in these vessels. However, the good news is that the Greenlanders prospered for a short time. Just like the people of Pablo Benito, New Mexico, they prospered. And as they were prospering, anything that they were going, anything that was going wrong, the only, the only thing that they could actually blame, the historians, the only thing that historians could blame is actually the Inuits. It was the Inuits that led to the decimation of the Greenlandic population. It wasn't our fault. The usual thing, you blame somebody else. In history, we always blame somebody else. What did we do in the Roman lecture last week? We blamed other people for the fall of the Roman Empire. We blamed barbarians when it was the Romans themselves that destroyed their own empire. From the number of farms in both colonies, whose 400 or so stone ruins still dot the landscape. If you look at that, that, that map, you can actually see that all those little dots indicate one of the, each individual one uh, it, um, is one of the 400 farmsteads with a population of 5,000 people. But the one thing is they didn't diversify. That is a key problem. They didn't diversify. And we know that in our own history, when, when, we, look at the, um, when we look at that period between 1315 and 1349, particularly in Cymru, particularly in Wales, what we see is cattle farming across the whole of Britain, actually. Um, and there isn't much um, growing of crops um, compared to the absolute intensity of cattle farming in Britain. And then what happens is there's less and less crops being grown because the cattle require more and more uh, more and more uh, crops to eat, um, and there's no diversification, that's when society starts to collapse. And the Greenland Vikings were in the same boat. They weren't diversifying. Now, I know it sounds absolutely ri ridiculous, but we have evidence in the isotopic and oxygen isotopic analysis in the bone structure that, that lots of Vikings initially didn't eat fish. They didn't eat fish. What they did, they, 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 they grew their cattle and sheep and they ate the red meat instead of, um, instead of having more agriculture, instead of having a limited amount of cattle and sheep. And they could, have eat, they could have eaten fish, but they didn't eat fish. No diversification. When you don't diversify, society is going to collapse. It's going to happen. And if you want to look at a par parody uh, about today's world, um, we were only reliant upon coal, and look what's happened. Um, we've we've been reliant upon our um, fast food restaurants instead of eating decent food. You know, all these things have been learnt and learnt about in the past. Without diversification, society will collapse. With a peak of five thousand people, they were trading with Norway, and trading with Norway probably and Iceland and maybe a couple of other countries in Europe. Um, but Norway had the better vessels for trade. And with the likes of Viking, um, Viking York, it's good that you mentioned Viking York because we've got artifacts um, in Viking York that have actually come all the way from um, Greenland. You know, we've got some, the, the only ivory that, the, the, the ivory that's been found in Viking York uh, about a thousand years ago actually comes from Greenland because there was no other ivory in the northern hemisphere except for walrus ivory that came from Greenland. So look at those wonderful trade links. For a, for a time there would be at least one vessel coming all the way from Europe into Greenland into the ports, maybe two, every month. And that really worked for a time. But in the 1300s there was about one vessel a year. And you know what? We've all felt that, haven't we? You know, we don't see anybody... Do you know what? I haven't actually seen any other human being other than my family in the past 10, 10 days. Um, uh, you know, I, you know that, that's 10 days, but these people are not seeing any other people for a whole year. Um, and you can get an idea what that was doing to their mindsets. 
in the 1300s, after a boat coming to them every single month, in the 1300s, they were getting one, one boatload of goods coming in. And it wasn't necessarily the things that they actually wanted either. Um, and the things, that, the things that were being traded in, in the 1100s, for example, they were exhausting narwhal um, tusks. Um, the narwhal, um, la very, very large uh, whale-like beast in the sea. Um, and they were exhausting the, these great tusks from the narwhal. The polar bear skin, they were exhausting the polar bears within their proximity. Um, they were butchering the walrus um, population. And just look at it, they were butchering the walrus population and leaving the bodies on the beach. So they were taking the, the ivory away, as people do in Africa, they butcher an elephant and leave the, the rest of the body there. Um, they, would be, they, would be, they would be doing the same. So in other words, that's going to attract other beasts and disease and all the rest of it. But they thought they were, they thought they were wonderful. They, they could keep consuming these resources over and over again and other hides and various other things and they would exchange these for timber iron various other tools um falcons for example why the hell do you need falcons in greenland but this is medieval society opulence let's have a few falcons alongside the bells that are going to be of no use to saving a population when it's needed and then they were importing in raisins and nuts and wine now come on this, this is, these are, they're living like Europeans. And if you go into somewhere like Greenland, you cannot live like a European. Um, you know, when we look at the Darien project in a few weeks time, when the, um, when the Scots went to Panama in the uh, 1690s, they had a ship full of periwigs. Believe it or not, kid you not, one of the five vessels was full of periwigs. <laughs> and, and, the, and the vessels with supplies sank. So um, when they were waiting on the dockside, somebody said, look, at, I've got the latest fashion from Scotland, the periwigs. And people were saying, we're dying. We can't eat these wigs. It's European mentality. It's the same mentality the, the, the Greenlanders had um, with, with the Norwegians. And, and if you want to go throughout history, for example, uh, the, the Germans at Stalingrad, the, the, um, the, the supply chain at, um, for the Germans at Stalingrad were dropping books and things, and they weren't dropping food. You know, um, you know it's the same mistakes we make throughout history. The main thing to keep population going is, is actually sustenance. You don't need wine. You don't need nuts. You don't need raisins. You don't need wigs. You don't need... It, and essentials like tinted glass and bronze bells. And unfortunately, this trade with all these silly things kept going on uh, um, uh, as, as the resources were going out. But there's, you know, I haven't really mentioned the church much. And those that have, um, those that have a thing for Christianity uh, will know that um, with the Christianity that was around in medieval Europe, I will completely demolish that, but not yet. Excavations at Eric's farm at Branhillid um, in the southern settlement uh, in 1932 revealed a church and a chapel. Now, the church that they revealed was originally surrounded by a, a turf wall to keep farm animals out. So obviously there were lots of animals around back when the church was built. Uh, just around, we've got about a date for about 990 actually, just not so long after um, Eric the Red has actually arrived there with his wife, Thorhild. Um, and they found this church. And guess what else they found? At Branhillid. They found a great hall. And then they realised this was Eric the Red's hall. Can you imagine that? Um... Um, can you imagine that, Jessica, right? You're an archaeologist as well, um, excavating on an archaeological site on a site that you're reading about that person in history. That, that's amazing. But that's yeah. exactly what the Danish archaeologists were doing in 1932. They were excavating the great hall that Eric the Red was actually sat in. He was sat in that great hall that they were excavating in 1932. Alongside the fire pits was Eric the Red and Lef Eriksson, his own son, was there in that hall 
on his own farm. And those fire pits, around them they were eating those meals, reciting those wonderful sagas. Those same sagas I used to listen to when I was a child. Um, they played board games, and you know, they played board games with these types of figures. These figures, which are a reproduction Lewis chess set, which you can actually see in front of my head, okay? These, these are re reproduction versions, so they, they're playing board games like chess and things like um, Pente, you know, little uh, peace board games. They, they, it was all there. This, this is in history. They're excavating in 1932 within the pages of history. Behind the church, they found the ruins of a cow barn. Now, that was interesting. The cow barn was of a later period, and how do we know it was of a later period? The stalls within the barn had partitions made from the shoulder blades of whales. They weren't wooden partitions, they were the shoulder blades of whales. Think about that. So they're, 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 using, they're using the lot because they've run out of wood, right? So this is what this is saying. After about, after about the 1100s, after about 100 years, wood was in short supply. And why was it sh in short supply? I tell you what, people, they were building those churches. When you build a church, you need scaffolding poles, needing decent timber to get higher. And on a church, you need a wonderful roof and wonderful doorways and all these wonderful things, consuming the real resources that these people needed as a population to survive. You remove the trees, you remove the shelter in the winter months, and you remove the ability for regeneration. And you're not going to have regeneration because of these damnable bloody sheep. Um, I don't know if it was in uh, the early the lecture earlier on. I haven't said this to you. When um, when I when I've been to Shetland and Orkney, the question I've always asked is why don't you grow more trees? And the answer is it's not because of the soil. It's because of those bloody sheep. Um, because of the grazing. If you've got these animals grazing every year, you're unable to grow new trees and hedges and so on. So to keep these sheep alive, you're, you're destroying your landscape. Um, and you've already destroyed it because you've cut down all the trees. This is, in fact, this is Easter Island all over again. Um, Easter Islanders didn't last as a, a population for thousands of years either. In 1961... 30 years after the finding of the church, they find another moment in history. When you actually flick through moments in history, it's very rare that you can actually touch them. You can read about them, but you can't actually touch them. And suddenly they're touching them and they're crinkling the pages. And in 1961, workmen find a small horseshoe-shaped chapel. And we know what this horseshoe-shaped chapel is. It's the chapel that Eric the Red built for his wife, Theodhild. Theodhild had become a Christian. She was a Christian by, a, um, by about 990. Eric the Red refused to convert to Christianity. But Theodhild was a Christian. Um, and she had the typical argument with her husband. I am right. And Eric said, OK, I agree with you. Um, and he built, it's a, it's, a type, it's a type of conversation I have at home every single day. You do this and you do it now. Okay, I'll do it. Fine. Excellent. So um, even if you don't think it's the right thing to do, that's the way it works. So Eric built this, um, this chapel for Thordhild. Uh, it's mentioned in history. They found it in 1961. Great. Um, Eric refused to surrender his beliefs, or did he? Thordhild held steadfast to hers. In time, he granted her um, another church as well. So we've got quite a number of churches being built there. Um, and this other church is the one that they'd already ex excavated in 1932, uh, which could fit about 30 worshippers of a length of about six and a half meters by about uh, um, uh, a length of 11 and a half meters by six and a half meters wide. If anyone's writing that down, just change the width of the length around. But anyway, so, so what we've got, we've got this wonderful, um, this, this wonderful community developing. And actually, to start off with, it, it sounds pretty good. 
Um, and the key to where we're going to go is the next little paragraph. During the excavations in 1961, in the 1960s, surrounding this little chapel of Fjordhild, Danish archaeologists found 144 skeletons. All of these 144 skeletons were basically of the same build. They were pretty tall individuals, taller than the Inuits, um, very much to um, the modern Scandinavians today. Males and females they found. And strangely enough, they found one male skeleton that was found with a large knife between their ribs. Now, you know, they'd obviously be buried in a Christian way. Fair enough. Who knows where the pagans are being buried? I know what Sword Hill did. She said, right, you've lived a pagan, you're dying a Christian. Very similar to Helen on the deathbed of Constantine the Great in 337. Um, you can imagine it now. I think I, all the archaeological evidence that we're going to come on to tells us that Eric the Red was buried alongside his wife. And we'll go on to that in a moment. But before we go on to that, a mass grave south of the church contained 13 bodies. What does this mass grave tell us? Well, the mass grave tells, told us that these bodies were all of about the same age, um, teens to middle age. So uh, 16 to about 30 odd. They were all around sort of that, that sort of age, fighting age. Lots of them showed battle wounds, but they were buried in one area, in a mass grave. But they, that doesn't show any signs that these people were fighting with the Inuits. They were fighting amongst themselves. We won't talk any more about that point. That might be a red herring. But what is very compelling is this next point. It's really compelling. And actually, Jessica, this is your homework yeah. for next week. You are going yeah. to prove if the, if the fellow, following question was answered. This is the question. The most compelling finds were three skeletons interred close to the church wall, just beneath where the eaves would have been. So ba basically, just, just alongside the church wall, the long church wall, the eave wall itself, um, what they found was three bodies. Usually, according to church sacraments, those that are buried closest to the church will be the ones that rise first on judgment day will be the ones who are first judged will be the ones who will lead the people isn't that right Anne? these three individuals archaeologist guests must have been fjord hild eric the red and Lef erickson the son of eric and thord hild could you imagine that? They, they do believe that those three bodies are actually those three figures and two of them very, very famous in history. And, if, and they are still examining those bones. I don't know if they're still examining them because this article is a few years old, but I'm hoping that they manage to get some DNA link to see if they are actually Thornhill, Eric, um, and their famous son, uh, Lef Erickson. It'd be great to actually get an understanding of what that is. So that's your homework, yeah. Jessica. That's um, straight in there, right? That's it. Um, but what I'm going to do next, I want to look at a few more images, and then I'm going to say something very sacrilegious, which will make Anne burn in hell for my remarks against the Catholic Church. But before we do that, um, Anne, Anne, I'm not going to mention um, to anybody, but Anne's religion is Catholicism. Um... Isn't that right, Anne? But she can't say anything. So here we go. This is this is that building at Branhillid. Um, and this is on the slope. Branhillid means steep slope. So that's at Branhillid, looking over the fjord. That's, that, that's a church. That's a very important religious building. But that's where they're putting their resources into. And back to that reference from 1721, the only remain standing in irony were in fact the churches. You know, it, it's, it's ironic that not civilization remains, the civilization of the church remains and, and everything else is gone. You know, people are gone, but Christianity in its edifices still survive. And, and, and I think that's, that's a stark reminder that you've got to, in other words, what they should have done first 
they should have established a footprint. They should have not built their civilization in Greenland on sand. They should have worked out their environment, been able to understand their environment, just like the Native Americans did and always have done so, and not exhaust it. Do you know what? Um, you know, we see the exhaustion of the resources here. And then what happens to spite the Native Americans? Um, and Pat isn't with us. Oh, is Pat with us today? Okay, uh, she is. Um, to spite those Americans, the Americans wipe out millions of buffalo on those plains in America. They wipe them out. And, and, and so the Native Americans have nothing to eat out of spite. Um, and that is, that is gonna be a precursor to doom the environment. Because all these animals and all these humans who work equally in, with the environment keep the environment going. And and moral of Greenland is, is that the exhaustion of resources. And there it is, steep slope, um, steep slope, Brown Hill. You, you can't imagine it today, but that there would have been trees there. There would have been um, low-lying willows. Uh, there would have been um, aspen, uh, there would have been all those types of trees growing naturally in the environment. Uh, probably a few rowan as well, Th those types of species, all types of species like that. Uh, and, and, you know, with that, you could imagine you could grow crops in amongst those trees and all the rest of it, but they, they didn't do that. They, they felled all those trees, used them all for building, that building there and all the other churches. Do you know what? There was probably as many churches as there was farms. That's a sweeping statement for as many churches as farms because they felt that God would protect them. But you know what? A little bit into the story, they realized that they'd made a big mistake. And why they had made a big mistake? Just a little bit of an overview. Um, the church took two thirds of the wealth of the people of Greenland, meaning that, they've got to, that the people of Greenland have got to destroy everything to give the church their wealth. And then they've got nothing then to survive upon. Typical morals of the church. And this is inside the church. And um, thumbs up. Does this church look familiar? Uh, and it's the church of St. Peter's, isn't it? This looks very similar to St. Peter's church. St. Peter's church is in the valleys, um, um, uh, basically at Brinner. And it looks very similar to this because it's built in exactly the same way. Really stout, thick walls, local sandstone, very small windows um, because of the environment at Brynner and the valleys. Uh, a church built exactly the same, uh, in exactly the same form. Um, and the one thing that has to be said is that inside they would have had rendered walls. This would have been painted. On the outside, rendered walls uh, painted. Um, green tinted glass windows, the bell and all the rest of it. And maybe there would have been <coughs> a first floor in there. Um, to an American like Pat, it's the second floor. But um, so the first floor in there, they may have actually, um, they may have actually had a storage inside the church of some form. Maybe, I'm not sure. Or maybe that's just an upper window to lead light in. It's very difficult to um, interpret this without the rest of the building. But again, looks very familiar to the type of building that we'd find in Wales um, from the medieval period associated with sandstone building with churches. And that there is the walrus um, ivory. Now, I do believe I have been talking um, nonstop for nearly um, 55 minutes and I'm gonna go on for another five minutes and I'm gonna have a go at the church. Um, <laughs> And put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> so here we go. Now, the one thing with the early establishment of these churches, they believed that they needed some sanctuary of the Church of Rome. And this was this was another one of their undoings. If they had said, right, we, we've got We've got a couple of priests over here, right? That's it. That's fine. Hopefully nobody from Rome is going to ask us for any tithes, right? They, they did the wrong thing. With the Islanders' early success, and, and, and they thought, wow, look at us. Look at us. Look how wonderful we are. We're doing really well. And they wrote a letter to the King of Norway in the 1100s, and they said, King of Norway, 
Um, please send us a bishop. And the king of Norway said, ah, mm, if I send a bishop, I can get more tax out of them. And also it'll make the church happy as well. So the church can get tax out of the Greenlanders as well. We can get loads of their goods. That sounds really cynical, but it's not as cynical as it sounds. So the king of Norway chose a certain Bishop Arnold. He was chosen for the job. He was not a man who wanted to go to Greenland because he had heard about the contentious behavior of the Greenlanders. They had developed a reputation. He didn't want to go. Arnold didn't want to be, I quote, I am not good at handling difficult people. I do not want to go king. But the king promised him a farm and, 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 and all the resources. Anyway, Bishop Arnold was sent over there. He was given the finest farm on Greenland alongside the fjord, not far from Branhill, not far from the home um, of Eric the Red. Obviously, he was dead by then, the 1100s. Um, and, and then immediately he said, right, we're going to erect a cathedral, the greatest cathedral in the northern hemisphere, with built of the local reddish sandstone and dedicated to the patron saint of seafarer, St. Nicholas. And also... He had built a hall that could accommodate up to 300 people and a huge barn that could accommodate 100 cows and a huge tithe barn. And you start to wonder why they went out with resources. Building these four structures with a limited amount of trees at hand would have meant that they would have decimated the landscape. But this is what the bishop insisted. This was the work of God to build these four great structures. Now you can imagine that the presence of the church was welcome, probably for a week. Um, and then they realized the Greenlanders' um, uplift was now their burden. They had to um, have excess for the church and for the king and to keep this fat overburdened bishop in his wealth to keep the cathedral going to keep nunneries going and all the rest of it there was barely enough to feed themselves and enough to trade with let alone give it to the the um, catholic church by the middle of the 1300s again that date 1315 mark that well the church owned two-thirds of the island's finest pastures in other words of two thirds of the land um, that, that was any good was now owned by the church and all that wealth went back to Rome. Tithes remained as onerous as ever. Some of those tithes uh, went directly to support the Crusades halfway around the world to keep the Pope in the fat life that he was used to be kept in, to fight heretics in Italy. These people were very resentful as they were unable to feed themselves, they had to feed the church in Rome. Church authorities, however, found it increasingly difficult to get bishops to come to the distant land. So in other words, bishops no longer bothered to go. They decided to send clerics to the um, Greenland instead to take and keep taking from the Greenlanders. So what we're going to do now, um, what I would like to do, I'm going to cut my background for a reason. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to stop the sharing. Oh, hang on. I can cut my background. Here we go. If, um, because I want to show you a couple of things. Hang on a minute. Uh, here we go. There we go. Nice. I love it. It feels a lot calmer with my window behind me. Um, and what we've got, we've got the walrus ivory in front of you. And... There you go. And if you think, if you're going to, um, if you'll bring you a little bit further over so you can all see this. Here we go. If you think, you can see that that itself would have created the, um, would have been carved out of this part. And then the queen, a bit thinner, would have been carved out of this part of the ivory. And then a bishop out of this part of the ivory. There you go. And then you have a rook. 
It's getting smaller each time. This is why they get smaller. Okay, so you've got uh, a rook there. And guess where you, and the rest of it is the pawns. Look at these tiny pawns. These are carved out, the rest of the ivory. So it's likely that if you've got a really long um, walrus tusk, you could have a complete chess set. Isn't that great? So what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna take a break because I do deserve it. Um, do you not think, Drina? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, right, Jessica, do I deserve a break? Yeah. Now, Jessica, I don't know what's happened through the lecture, but we've only got the top of your head. But anyway, Jessica, tell us um, any, anything you would like to add to that. To any of this? Yeah, anything at all? You want to say anything? Not really, no. Um, I did notice that um, what was quite interesting is um, there was, um, obviously when I went to Europe, it was quite recently, um, they had a lot of chess pieces made out of ivory and it was quite interesting to see the link now from when I went there. Um, it's quite interesting to know that game pieces were something that was still used so long ago and you think that it would probably be something that is a recent thing, but it's not. And I think it's that's not. really interesting. And, and there, there's a direct link with York, so it, it sort of all fits in. Um, yeah. So, um, Drina, anything you'd like to say before I let the rabble on? Um, walrus hunting was a group effort. Um, it, it, it was, was no, actually, actually, you could say it was a group, group effort, but um, I, I, there, was, there was a program on a TV recently, and if, you, if you've got a slope, Right, you can um, herd the walruses up to the top of the slope. Um, yeah. And they will naturally try to get to the water. So they'll jump over the cliff and they'll just, they'll die when they um, hit the bottom. And it, okay. it, you, you only need two people to do that. Oh, you really? can just drive them up. And actually, the, 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 yeah. there's another phenomenon. When there's too many of them on a beach, uh, some of the bigger walruses um, force the smaller walruses up on the slope. The smaller walruses naturally panic, go to the top of the cliff, try to get into the water, and they just jump over and they and they, and they die. It's a, it's a bit like it's a bit like lemmings, and it's a bit like the um, the mammoths. There's lots of evidence in Mexico now, and there's there's evidence off. Um, I think it's the island of Alderney or Guernsey, where they found large amounts of mammoth bones, and they they realised that. Um, they would one or two hunters just just sort of chased them and they all went over a cliff <laughs> or they went into pits so yeah. what we're going to do um we're going to we're going to we're going to cut we're going to cut the images um uh, and then everyone can have their mics on so everyone keep this short because um mr carl james langford top class archaeologist the best archaeologist in the world <laughs> um has to have a break <laughs> so um Henri, um, any uh, anything you want to say? No. All That's right better. then. I'm back now. Um, I think it's quite clear that uh, the human race hasn't <laughs> learned any lessons <laughs> when it comes yeah. to dealing with um, its resources. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know. To, to be honest, to, when, when you think when you think about, um, I, I don't I don't want to talk about it because um, you know the present situation, and I, I've I've had on my Facebook lots of people not happy with you know certain things going on, and my answer is well, if you look at it as us, if you look at it as humanity needs to work together. Uh, then you don't need all this protesting. Uh, and if you have mutual respect and mutual admiration, then you don't need all this protesting. And uh, if, if only the Greenlanders had worked with the Inuit sooner, the answer to today's problems would have been solved. Um, Pat, anything you want to say? Oh, I always enjoy hearing you talk about Greenland. It's, um, it's very dramatic and it's... Uh... You gave a lecture something similar, the class, a few years back, and 
really amazing story. Yeah. Exactly. And, and there's more to come, Pat. Thank you very much. Um, and Anne Savita. Um, I like the way I like the uh, talk very much and the way you linked it to today's world. But also, I think when the Western people have moved almost, you think of the, how they treated the Native Americans, the Aborigines, the um, Maoris, everywhere they've done damage by yeah. that attitude and they still are doing. You, you know, you know, um, I, I was, um, and, and we'll come to Dell after I said this. Well, actually, Dell, you, you say your thing and I will say my bit and we'll have a break. Go on, Dell. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, I learned some new stuff, which is about the uh, religion. Um, I didn't sort of uh, consider, you know, Catholicism and sort of whatever was going on, like the Celtic Church. Um, because when we talk about the Vikings, we always think of um, whatever their religion was, what we would probably know as paganism. Yes, yes. Yeah, so that was new mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. But, but what Greenland is somewhere, oh. or Greenland somewhere I would lovely, uh, love to visit. And Jessica, are you going to say something quick and I'll do my thing? Uh, I always think of things like um, runes uh, when I think of Vikings. Um, just sort of little things like that. Definitely paganism. With um, I, But I never thought of Christianity to be anything to sort of merge with the Viking. So yeah, that was quite interesting to learn. And I, I think I think lot, when you look at the subtext, maybe it was that that connection with Christianity that was actually the downfall of the Vikings in the first place. But that that's a bit of a we've we've got the second half coming anyway. And I what I want to do is have a ten minutes break rather than a fifteen minute break. But I would say um, you know I, I got really upset at the beginning of the week. Um, you know in regards to the statues, in regards to. Um, in regards to all of this, and I, I, I wrote a letter for my political party that's being sent out across Wales because apparently it was pretty good. Um, and I basically said by saying, look, you know, this is a situation about us. It's not just one group of people. Um, you know, I, 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 I was saying, for example, that I, I found out um, over the past few years that both of my lines and my family are, are actually Romani Gypsy. And I get really upset and angry that every time we have Holocaust Day, that half a million people, that I can say my people, half a million Gypsies who went to the concentration camps who died, nobody ever remembers them. So if we want to start spouting yeah. off about statues and memorials and all the rest of it, it's not just one racial group that suffered, it's many. And I, I just really, I, you know, what's going on at this minute by one group of people is causing even more division. It's them and us. And what it should be, it should just be us. And, and that's what I'm saying. Um, so we're going to have a break now. And, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. And you yeah. wanted to say something, Jessica. You got your hand up. Oh, have I? Oh, no. Um... I did see your comments actually on Neil McAvoy's uh, post about the statue, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, at the moment, I just feel like the times are going on. I feel like we're in some sort of dystopian world with a lockdown and protests going on. And mm, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the lack of history, I think, from a lot of people is shocking. Um, I, I got told by one the other day for bonus for my history. Uh, uh, I was like, I, I know a bit about history. I do a I've done a degree in it, so. But it's, it's an interesting time. Yeah, yeah it, it is. It is. It is. It is. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a drink and um, Drina and Jessica talk about the cricket. By the way, LBW's been bowled out. <laughs>
This is the point. We need to try and get. Hey, what are you reading? Hey, you. What are you reading? Mommy, mommy, mommy. Where's my mommy crow? Where's my mommy crow? You can go back tomorrow if you if you go back on weekend if you want. In my diary, there was a list of things to do. Oh, flipping out. Fire, 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 fire. Everyone's gone. Right, DNA links.
the questions you old witch well you didn't want to know what i knew yeah i wanted to know what you knew but no sir we know none of us are interested now because you went off look i i still got that book who's that oh, by then look how thick it is that's not good that's not good by a good old magnus isn't it no it's, it's by milan candera oh, oh well we all know her Milan. Oh, Ted Hughes. Hang on, Ted Hughes? Was he a philanthropist? No, he's the, uh, he's the poet laureate. Hey, what, um, Jessica, were you saying on academia all the documents are free at this minute? Pardon? Did you say on academia all the, all the documents were um, free online or something? It's a JSTOR at the moment, while the pandemic's going on, and um, it's all free at the moment. Oh, oh right. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll have to, uh, yeah, cool. I was going to ask you, Carl. Uh, no, I'm not, I, I am not going to marry you, you old hag. <laughs> what? I'm too old now. Um, too old for what? <laughs> You're never too old. You know, my, my, my granddad said, you're never too old for a bit of the other. That's what my granddad used to say. Oh, well. Um, and how old was he when he said that? 90. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I got a way to go yet. Um, I was going to... Oh, yes. Um, what... How did you get your books? Um, we are recording. Right. So, that... Do you know, to be honest with you, we, we, we should have just stopped the lecture before the break because um, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can match that in the second half. Yeah, um, what, what was it? The overview is a really good lecture. It was, as, it was, it was as good as one I did years ago. Um, it was, it, there was comedy in it. Um, my God, that's a lot to build up to. Yeah. And, and actually somebody actually learned something, which is unusual for seven people. So, right, let, let's get into it. So, the one thing, the one honest thing that we can say is that we have got so much to learn um, from Greenland and we've got so much to learn about the Vikings there. And I think, I think the sensible avenue should to be, to go down um, is to think that there were a number of different factors that led to the collapse of the Greenlandic um, civilization, the Greenlandic people. And when you think about it, it, it is only, I know this sounds, this is, sounds terrible. It, it is only um, 5,000 people we're talking about its height of civilization, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's a civilization that has been greatly talked about. It's not one of those ignored areas of history. So life went sour for the Greenlanders in in other ways. The number of Norwegian merchant vessels, as we said, dropped. Um, people felt cut off. They didn't have the materials either to maintain their own vessels. And I've also mentioned that um, trade with Africa for um, elephant ivory replaced the trade uh, that these people were offering in regards to walrus ivory. Mm -hmm. So the isolation grew steadily but became more intense and it became more intense because they had other factors. They had this steadily um, deteriorating environment, um, their, farm yan, their farmland exploited to the full, so it lost 
its fertility. Um, so there's two factors, um, erosion, lots of wind. You know, it could be said that even with the rejuvenation of the dwarf willows that were there and the alders and the other trees that were there, they were then needed for basic fuel to create charcoal, um, to smelt their bog iron, to repair their tools and to make new tools, which yielded very poor iron indeed, but that's all they had. So the catastrophe is building. And is all this true? Can we prove all this or is just this just fiction? What we have found from the ice coring is that there's a dramatic decline over um, 300 years at least, probably from about the 1100s into the 1400s, uh, the dramatic decline in the species available um, that they're finding in the ice core analysis in associated with the pollen. Um, and that will be reiterated by what I've always already said, the overgrazing, the trampling, the scuffing of, of the sheep, the goats and the cattle. And it really deep the landscape. You know, I, I feel that they should have rotated their farming. They, they could have had um, intense agriculture one year, then they could have uh, allowed the, the animals to graze upon it, and then the next year just left it fallow. Just what, just the type of, just the type of agriculture um, that was going on in Britain at that time. But even with that said, that would, that would eventually fail. Um, so they would have always had to have diversified. It's, it's a bit like, it's a bit like what we've done with Archaeology Cymru. You know, we've, um, four months ago, I was out there teaching classes and I had a very small um, class on Skype. And now um, the last count was I was teaching 64 people on the internet. And it's just thinking, well, and we're not doing any classes in person. I was diversifying. If I'd have kept to what we had done, we wouldn't be doing this now. So you've always got to diversify. I know that's a really bad metaphor, but you've got to learn from the people around you like the Inuit, diversifying mm -hmm. like them. Mm -hmm. The Greenlanders climate began to change, as we've mentioned. Summers grew shorter, progressively cooler, um, a lot of rain in the summer months. And we actually see this in, in 1315. And a few things we've got to say about 1315, going up to the date 1349, is that 1315 in the Western Hemisphere was the real beginning of the collapse of the environment in the Western Hemisphere, the mini ice age. That's fact one. Up until that point, the population of Britain had been um, had exceeded 7 million people. Um, already mentioned about the cattle. The cattle were kept in people's houses. Cattle carries anthrax. Trading in cattle carries anthrax. Spreading anthrax around Europe between 1315 um, and 1349. Summers were shorter, they were a great deal wetter, meaning that you're unable to um, collect winter fodder to feed the animals over the winter months. That's gonna rot away before you even put it into its sheds. And then you've got the outbreaks of plague, um, pestilence, anthrax, and all the rest of it. So all that's happening. Now, do you know what one of you said earlier on about I'm making analogies with today? And this is a really important one. Again, there are always points of a lecture that I like people to remember, and this is one of them. Compare, write down, if you've got a pen, 1315 to 1349. All, that, all those facts I've just given you. Right, that's one. Um, and then what you need to do, you need to write down uh, the year 1989 and the year 2020, right? Now, in 1989, government statements were made and there was a large fuss made that we've suddenly realized that we're gonna have a climatic disaster if we don't do something about it. In 1989, people started saying the climate's changing, we've gotta do something about recycling, we've gotta do something about the, the environment and all the rest of it. In 1989 was the time that they started coming out with films about uh, Brazil um, and the destruction of the Amazon basin and all these other things, 1989. That's the same as 1315. Suddenly there was a moment in 1315 where the height of civilization had been reached in the, in the Western hemisphere. And then in 1349, you've got the first major out 
outbreak of the pandemic of plague in Wales. 1348, it hits England, okay? Um, the first outbreak of the bubonic plague, and it goes in four waves. Bubonic, which is um, the buboid, pneumonic, chest, septicemic blood, and abortive plague, which doesn't really um, have much effect on population, but the other three do. And if you can't see that there's, um, that, that is the, those are the same things happening, they didn't learn in 1315, they didn't change their ways because of change. We didn't learn in 1989, we didn't change because of our ways. We have repeated history, it's happened again. And that's not just a passing analogy, that's something that I deeply believe. Do you know what? I, I was from throughout, throughout about, about 2008 um, to about 2015, uh, I truly believe that we were going for a period of climatic change, um, that the Northern Hemisphere would, would go into a, would start to freeze. Um, and I probably start, I, I, I probably deep down believe that still. But I've got to go with the science to say that um, temperature's rising. Um, and between 1989, we're talking about one degree increase in temperature, uh, possibly that, that is coming that way, um, and a gradual increase in temperature um, between 1315 and 1349 of one degree as well. If we want to sort of do a mean uh, approximation, it's about half a degree, which science would act, scientists would actually agree with. So does that actually make sense, um, um, Henry? Yeah, I think that's it, it's it's like a, looking in a mirror again, isn't it? Um, mm. And actually looking at the events and saying, well, actually there is a correlation of, of what's going on. Mm. There is, and you know when people do conspiracy theories and all the rest of it, it's not a conspiracy theory. I, I, I've studied this for a very long time, and and unfortunately, this is what's happening. Um, but we we but. Um, we have still got, we've still got time to do something different. We've still got time to change things. We don't, we don't have to wait for the second outbreak of the pandemic. We can do something now. Um, and, and they didn't have a choice back then. They didn't know what, but we do have the science to do something about it. And we can do something about it. And, and that, that is a warning from history. Yeah, I think that's probably the w one difference that the other, well, the other factor that's going to be more significant is the size of population compared to 5,000 to, let's say, 9 billion. Yeah. Um, is, is a, a, you know, a, a serious negative factor in uh, what could happen. Yeah. Um, I think you meant about the population of the world back then um, of about 750 million to the seven seven yeah, and a half sorry. billion people today yeah so so yeah but don't apologize the, the point i was trying to make between 13 15 and 13 14 49 the temperature wasn't a drop of one degree um it was a drop of half a degree but the point i was trying to make um it was that fluctuation of one degree like we've got a fluctuation of about one degree now the overall, the overall is a drop of um, the overall is an increase of, of half a degree. So then it was a drop of half a degree. Now it's an increase of half a, de half a degree. So in other words, what we can say is that they are running greatly in parallel. It's just the same events leading to a similar outcome. Yeah. Yep. Full of that. So uh, what, one, why one, why one, what, one, one sec. One, one is uh, one is obviously um, minus, and the other one is plus. Um, who else was going to say something? I was. Um, it's Anne. Um, yeah. in, the, in, in those days, they had this calamity coming, this right. But would they have really understood the climate changes, which we have understood here since 18, uh, 1989? We've understood it. Uh, whereas perhaps they couldn't have done anything then. Right, can I jump in there, Anne? I don't, I, to be honest with you, I think you're wrong. I don't, I don't think we've understood it at all. Well, um, well. We, we knew some it in have. we knew yeah some of us have yeah but in 1989 in 1989 the politicians were warned and they're still not taking any notice yeah. so yeah, that's your point so yeah, sorry sorry about that you, you were saying we yeah some of us have realized others haven't <laughs> the scientists uh, have been telling us it's just the politicians who haven't listened really exactly um and with with it with all with all this said um you know, one, one key point, one key aspect is 
the Inuit knew, they, they, the Inuit could see that there was massive changes going on in the environment. Yeah. They survived. Um, so it's, it's, it's the same thing as today. Some of us do realize, but others don't. And, and the ones that don't are the ones that are not going to survive. And I know that sounds a bit of a sweeping statement, but uh, this is the way things are going. Yeah. Just one question, Carl. Do we know sure. the population of the Inuit at, the, at that time? Um, formidable and um, when I say formidable, it was a population that was able to keep check of itself. The, you know, the, these these were people who were moving around a lot so their population numbers would have been quite low children would have been res restricted to smaller numbers if you've got like a greenlandic population when they're, they're thinking about big families they may have had big families but then it's trying to sustain those families which would have been a problem yeah uh, i think what, what's going through my mind is obviously that the uh, the environment for this extra five thousand that turn up on the doorstep is just not sustainable you know and i think it's, clearly... it, it, it's not sustainable exactly it, it could have it, it could have been sustainable but it was not sustainable that that's the difference um but anyway going going back to what we were do, doing during the worst years when rains would have been heaviest the hay crop would barely have been adequate to see the penned animals through the coldest days let alone the humans over the decade, the drop in temperature seems to have had an effect on the design of the Greenlanders' houses, as we saw um, a little while ago. Originally conceived as single room structures, like the Great Hall of Branhillid, eventually they were divided into smaller structures. So in other words, they, they, could, they could have these big structures with the big beams and all the rest of it, and then suddenly they realized they couldn't anymore. They had to have that sense of division. Things had changed. The environment had changed. Okay, it was great that they had smaller rooms. It was great that they were able to keep themselves warm. Just like those people building those settlements in Neolithic at Scarabray. These were warrens of interconnected chambers. It was great. But unfortunately, um, in some cases that we're going to go on to, Animals are living in close proximation with human beings, which, an, which is an absolute disaster, particularly large mammals. When the Norsemen arrived in Greenland, um, it was almost as if, because the Inuits were here, there, and everywhere, and it was a very large landscape, um, you know, there was no competition for resources. But as the Westerners destroyed um, those resources, that kept taking and taking those resources, then that's when they're coming across um, conflict with the Inuits, because the Inuits are thinking, hang on a minute, right down in down in that um fishing ground down there there were loads of walruses and now there's only a few and now we've got to directly compete with these people from europe for this land um it was just that and it what and the different the, the key difference um henry the key difference is that where the inuits take what they need and that's all they take the Westerners, thank you very much, Michelle. The, the, Westers are, are take, the Westerners are taking what they need and also excess is going elsewhere. Um, they're taking more than they need, the Westerners, far more than they need. And that's another point of the difference in lifestyle. The Inuits take what they need. We took what we needed and actually more than we needed. So this is when we start to exhaust the landscape. So Inuit Norse relations seems to have been fairly friendly and then there might have been hostility and there might have been movements of these Greenlanders to other places in North America. But the one thing is, if we, if we, if we listen to this next thing, I'm going to change the images. Uh, there's one point of view and then there's another point of view. So that, that's, that's, what, that's what gives this lecture some balance. So we're looking at exhaustion of these resources and we've got a timeline Look at this timeline and I will speak and we will, we will look at my, my other facts here. Keep that timeline with you. So um, this, this is where it goes. The Nordics, those from Norway, men, mention of the Inuit is curiously scant in the surviving documents. They do mention these Inuits, the Skrelings. 
An old story tells of hunters coming across small people, the Skraelings, with whom the Greenlanders apparently fought, apparently. The Nordic text says that when these people are hit, their wounds turn white and they do not bleed. But when they die, there is no end to the bleeding. Um, I, I've heard that said about um, certain races on this planet today uh, by racists, but we don't need to go there. The next account, the second account, is that of Ivar Bardson in the description of Greenland. Bardson reported on the takeover of the Western settlement by the Skraelings with the implication that they had killed the inhabitants. So in other words, he's writing about the events of 1350, right? The Western settlement, the Northern settlement had been abandoned. The Skraelings were to blame for it. They wiped out the inhabitants, but there's a, there was no proof. But he had to come up with an answer. Years later, another source described, probably looking about the 1400s, described the Skraling attack in the Eastern settlement, the lowest, lowest of the settlements, mm -hmm. right? The, the lowest of the three, in which it says that 18 Greenlanders met their deaths and two boys and a woman were captured. And then the archeologists started to look for this evidence. And you know what? They couldn't find any. The only houses that they could find abandoned weren't burnt down. It was almost as if people left in a rush. There was no, there was no evidence that any Skralings had been there. On, an, on another article that I read years ago, apparently there was, um, there was another source and another document for Norway. It said something about um, the, the Greenlanders, um, a few of them died and there was a few children left. And it said that the Skralings come into the, 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 the settlement and took away the children because there were no adults left and looked after the children as their own. But that's not the Inuits taking over the settlement, killing everybody, is it? It's actually looking after the children, which is another story, which is another way of looking at things. But if you want to look at it in, an, in a biased point of view, the Skralins killed the parents and they took the children away. But that's not what actually happened. Um, the, the Inuits, the Inuits, even if they're said to have massacred the Greenlanders, they don't reuse the buildings. They don't take anything away. They leave the looms and the clothing and everything there. It's very likely that the Inuit thought of the, of the Westerners as stupid people. They probably thought, actually, we're not going to go to those buildings down there because if we go there, we're going to die. Because people who go into the buildings, they, those die. We've seen them. They, they never come out because the Inuits understand that there's a disease. So they're not gonna go there. It's not in an Inuit's best interest to go um, and wipe out a settlement of Greenlanders. Because if they did, they would have died themselves from the diseases that they carried. Yeah. So these are really interesting points. And in the archeology, span this is, this is a very interesting point. So this is where it gets a bit gory. On one, Valley Farm excavated in 1977. It revealed just how desperate some of the Greenlanders had become. During a freezing winter, the farmers killed and ate their livestock. There's nothing unusual about that, is there? They killed the newborn calves and lambs in this one building. The evidence was just left on the floor, leaving the bones and hooves on the ground where they had butchered them. They'd eaten, the, they'd eaten the flesh and just um, left there. Even the deer hound, their, their beloved deer hound, their companion, they had slaughtered it for food. The leg bones bore the nicks of a knife blade. So, you know, they're eating their hunting animals, so things are getting really bloody yeah. bad. This is the Skralings. They did that. No, they didn't. They didn't. Similar remains were found on another farm. So they excavated another farm in 1977. Um, and they had, the evidence was that they did the same thing. But in this other house, this is where the evidence gets really bad. Whoever killed the animals was used to living in squalid conditions. The bone littered earthen floors were in layers. So as they butchered the animals, they just chucked them on the floor 
And then in the archaeology, they found layers of insulating twigs and all sorts of other things on the ground, yeah? Haylage and so on. And this, they found the remains of the bones of little mice. And the egg, um, the egg um, pupae of various varieties of fly. They actually, they actually, they actually worked out that um, various different flies eat various different things. So some flies um, feast upon flesh, some flies feast upon animal fecal matter, human fecal matter. So by examining all the evidence of these flies, they were able to work out that the buildings were stinking. Mm. There, there was human, okay, do it in the right context. There was human shit there, animal shit there. There, there was rotting flesh, there was bones, all this stuff, all on the floor, right? Flies were not a native creature to North America. They had been, um, no, to Greenland. They'd been invited in inadvertently by the Vikings, carried on board their boats. Um, Greenland we're talking about, not, not North America. Yeah. And, and the interesting, I said that date earlier on, 1350, which is close to 1349. Yeah. I told you to write down the date 1350. Radiocarbon dating tells us that those buildings were abandoned in 1350. Um, everything was left there. Um, presumably when the structures were no longer inhabited, they didn't find any human remains. Um, the, the people had obviously just left. The other evidence was, is that people defecated where they stood and ate. It, it, all, it was all languishing on the floor, along with the bones and everything. These, these people were eating and drinking and defecating in the same area. These were really, really bad conditions. And it can only be seen alike to people in searing cold conditions. Um, I, I've... I'll admit it, I've been in a tent in the winter, right? And um, I, I've taken a tin can in with me and I urinated in the tin can because it's been too cold to go outside, right? Um, but if you're living with those conditions 24 seven and it is really, really, really cold, um, then people are just, they're losing their morals. They're, use, they're losing their sense of humanity. They're no, they're, their humanity's gone. It's so cold and is strangely enough, the buildings were abandoned. At some stage, they thought, we can't do this anymore, we're going. Yeah, just get out of there. We've got to get out of there. Do you know, um, we hear cases these days where people have been imprisoned and, and they've been put in rooms and they've been defecating because they've got no choice. Um, I've, see, I've, I've read reports of this and we see things in the media and you think, that's impossible to believe. These people also had no choice. They were prisoners of the searing cold conditions. Um, so where these people went, we don't know. But if they, they weren't killed by the Inuit, because there's no evidence for it. There's no evidence at all. And, ye, and th there's scant reminder in my mind that some people got so desperate, they said to the Inuits, look, we're desperate. OK, you were right. Can we, can we go with your society? And, and it, it, it may have been possible. The only way of doing that is looking at the DNA of some of the existing Inuit population to actually find that. Now, I would like to, um, I would like to look at that um, chart that you've got in front of you, which, which we're going to do now. Um, and I'm hoping to finish in 20 minutes. It's going to it's gonna get to five again. Christ. Dale, I do know you've got to leave at five, so that's fine. So this, this timeline here, let, let's just, just get do this timeline. Um, so what's rather interesting about this timeline is that uh, we see that um, it's saying that winter temperatures drop below the long term average by more than a degree halfway through um, uh, this, this period. Right. So the points that we're talking about here is when the settlements established. Yep. Um, here is when things are brilliant. Mm -hmm. So that's that's 1000 years A.D. Um, and things it's likely start to change here. It's likely at this stage, the temperature starts to drop on, only a little bit, not too much. But then this here is the period of the mini ice age. And then it hits this period. And that there is 1350. It's all about 1350, my friends. Right. And then by this point, 
that's when the last um, wedding is recorded on Greenland. And about here is off the chart. Oh, no, it's here. That's right. Sorry. That, that is the date of, of the last person being found alive on Greenland. Actually, when I say alive on Greenland, they found a person face down dead on the beach. He had just died. And that right. was the last person to ever be found um, on Greenland. That was the last of the population. If, if these Skralins had wiped out the population, he would be dead as well. Yeah, why, yeah, why was he left? Exactly, exactly. He survived. Well, he must have survived a while because he had parents after all. Um, so if we, if we go a little bit further, I've got a lot to do um, still. And I'm going to try and fit this in. Um, they're not using vessels like this um, by um, 1300. They are, um, they are the, tr the trading vessels that we sort of see um, that we were describing the other week. We went to 1588. You know, the big fat, flat bottom yeah. vessels, yeah. which were not good uh, in open water. They were better for coastal trade. Why would you take a vessel like that to Greenland? You're going to keep it in Europe. So there you go. This is when things are starting to change. Um, <clears throat> I want to do this, but I'm going to do this if I can get the other bits and pieces done. So we're going to go on to that. So when they, um, this next point is, is massively important. In 1920, on the lowest most tip of Greenland, there was a church and its cemetery was eroding into the sea. And the excavation, the, well, the discovery was being made by archeologists in the 1920s. And along the beach, there were loads of, um, there were loads of robes and hoods and cowls and the hats, stockings, all clothing paraphernalia. And these all dated, we believe from around the 1350s. <laughs> Um, and lots of the bodies seem to have been buried of people who showed heavy wear on their teeth. They showed signs of excessive rheumatoid arthritis, so various different bacteriums and diseases causing that. And lots of these robes showed signs that they had been patched up and repaired. People were, in other words, what happened is people were just buried in the clothing that they wore. And that was probably the only clothing that they had. Uh, they were at all being patched up. The other point as well is looking at the clothing, the archaeologists were a bit shocked. If these were clothing, if this was clothing from the 1350s, 1400, why was this clothing as if it had been made for people in the 1250s and the 1300s? Lots of the style of the clothing uh, was 50 to 100 years out of date indicating that these people who wore these clothes had had no contact with the outside world for decades because you know what women and women are like what's the latest fashion in europe you know um is it is it that um is it that long decorative streamer that flows down your back when you're wearing a cape or is it a burgundian cap without anyone coming in to tell you what the fashion is you're not going to change it. And if you're, if, you're, if you're not trading any new clothing, you're going to be using the same clothing over and over again. And this is another point um, that we're thinking of, that, that they, they were so, so isolated. You could chuck in that there was a level of inbreeding as well, and that would have affected the population. Um, the, which, which is not that I've come across in my notes anywhere, but that, that sticks in my mind. Now, it's it's is it um some people have suggested that um one of the one of the things that may have happened is that the people of greenland may have been wiped out by basque pirates so how do you explain people surviving it doesn't make sense the 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 persistent question of what happened to the greenlanders there are various different theories did some of them just disappear to north america the idea that there may have been a migration it, it, they could have had such a severe winter that they all thought, right, we're leaving. But there's one problem with that. Without material to repair the vessels that they had, they wouldn't be going anywhere. Um, with, with, with leaky boats, with rotten timbers, without 
timber to repair them without the nails and the boats and all the rest of it. You can't patch a, you can't patch a ship up with a dwarf willow. You know, you need proper timber to do that. The other thing that's been pointed towards the, um, the diaspora, the disaster, the collapse of the Greenlandic population may be to do with this. In 1402, the plague finally reached Iceland. And chroniclers tell us that two thirds of the Icelandic population was wiped out. Two thirds in just two years, which equates to the death of the population of, of Britain, for example. It, all it would have needed was one single ship mm. to have headed towards Greenland, to have stopped at the East Settlement, the middle settlement and the western settlement and you know what um if they had have had clothing on board any supply people would have jumped on that ship and said look we want all this we want all this everyone would have been come infected instantly there would have been they, they wouldn't have been able to stop themselves you you've you've seen it in the in the videos on tv um the first time that they're sort of allowing people to go into Tesco's and they, they don't have social limiting, people just crowd in there. And then the government saying, oh my God, you know, we can't have this because it's going to, you know, the pandemic's going to spread amongst all the population going in the shop. And the point is, that would have had a dramatic effect on the population. But people do still survive. That is the thing. Um, now... As, as, we sort of, as we sort of get slowly to the end of this, we, we, think about, we think about where the evidence is that we can look towards understanding what's happening. Let's look at the church, for example, um, and let's look at the violence. Look at the, let's look at the church buildings. None of the buildings that they excavated have showed any signs that any of them were destroyed by fire. None of the buildings show any signs of violence. Um, there's no evidence that havoc has been wrought in any of these settlements. Uh, it's saying that if such raids happened, but the, the Basque pirates, Norwegian um, sailors or anything, uh, if any of this has happened, where is the evidence? Um, archaeologists say that when they've excavated the church buildings, They've not, found any, um, they've not found any silver or any gold objects in them. It's likely that um, th those church buildings, anyone, anyone would have said, they would have said, right, if we're going to be leaving here, let's take the religious objects out of the church. But there's no evidence of those buildings being destroyed either. So that's a really important thing. The, the, ans the answer is manifold. Um, and one, one archaeologist said this, an archaeologist that participated on the ex excavations in Greenland from America, uh, from New York um, College, um, a certain Thomas McGovern, he says that he's proposed that the Norsemen lost the ability to adapt to changing conditions, which I've mentioned. He sees them as the victims of hidebound thinking and of a hierarchical society dominated by the church and the biggest landowners. We, we see that with the Catholic Church in Africa today. They say that people can't use contraception. So people still keep having children because the church says you can't use contraception. In their reluctance to see themselves as anything but Europeans, the Greenlanders fail to adopt the kind of apparel that the Inuit employed as protection against the cold and damp or to borrow any of the Eskimo hunting gear. So in other words, they... they didn't borrow any of the technology from the Eskimo, from the Inuit. They ignored the toggle harpoon. They didn't use the toggle harpoons that the, um, the Inuits used, which would have allowed them to catch seals, for example, through holes in the ice in winter. Yep. They also, the, the, the Vikings on Greenland didn't even have fish hooks, where the Inuits had fish hooks. And you're thinking, Surely an Inuit may have left a fish hook behind. Surely they would have realized. Surely they would have looked at how the Inuits are catching their animals and fishing. But there's no evidence to say that they learned anything. 
Instead, the Norsemen remained wedded to their farms and to the raising of sheep and goats and cattle. Whichever worsened conditions that must have made maintaining their herds next to impossible, as we've already seen. The same archaeologist McGovern also believes that as life became harder, the birth rate declined, not only with animals, but with humans. The young people who did come along may have seen a brighter future waiting somewhere else. The depredations of the plague in Iceland and in Norway could have created vacancies. So, in other words, Somebody sails into the, uh, the East Settlement and the Southern Peninsula of Greenland in 1402. Yeah, it's the same time that the plague could have got there. Um, and they were unaware and they thought, right, it's the first vessel that we've seen in four years. We're leaving. See you, mum and dad. We will come back someday. And they never, ever do. Yeah. Yep. They never, ever do. And in fact... Do you know what? There are parallels with this. I don't know which island it is. It's one of the Scottish islands. Um, and in the 1960s, um, in the 1960s, um, lots of children left. Um, I, I think it's South Uist or something like that. Um, lots of children um, left their parents. And they said, mum and dad will be coming back. And they never did. So the parents die inside the houses. And, there's, and some people look around the houses and these houses on this island in Scotland, um, you know, they're all being overgrown, but you, you go in there and the, um, there's beans still on the stove and there's a half open tin of something. Um, and there's, there's clothes still on a radiator by the fire and they've just been abandoned. This is exactly what we're seeing with Greenland. Um, you know, similar events repeated in history. All, when we mentioned Scara Bray, there was a, there was a, there was a rapid abandonment of Scara Bray. People just left something happened um we we see these modern parallels and we see we we try to understand the past from it with a dwindling population now i'm going to look at those last images and we're going to close with this paragraph in front of us but we're not going to do that paragraph yet so let's get let's go back to my images and somebody saying something um saint kilda thank you dal it was saint kilda that i've just dal you are very useful sometimes um, Adele, I know you've got to leave soon, so I'm going to try and in six minutes we're going to come up with a conclusion and everything else. So basically, Greenland Vikings, uh, I don't like to use the word Celtic blood because Celtic means British, so in my eyes, um, excavating there on Greenland, they found out um, in, um, in this mass grave, um, looking at the DNA evidence of this mass grave, that it showed quite um, a massive tick that the people from the people living in Greenland had DNA that was half British and half Norwegian. Um, and it says in this article, this, this, this goes back to these bodies that they saw in that mass grave, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Um, and it goes at the bottom, it says, it says earlier studies of populations living in Faroe Island and Iceland have shown that it was primarily the women who were of, uh, who were of British, it says Celtic origin. The archaeologist writing said, said that indicated the Vikings may have come from Norway down past the British Isles, where they took women with them and then continued on into the, in the North Atlantic to the Faroe Islands um, Iceland and Greenland. I think that's, you know, a, a bit sort of Hollywood, but the evidence is that half of their DNA is Norwegian, half of it is from the British Isles. So those Greenlanders weren't fully um, Viking, they were half uh, British. However, we've always known that Norsemen travelled a lot and we also know um, that the early inhabitants of the island have those traces of DNA. It also says that even though um, even though they were half and half, everything these Greenlanders did, their culture, their understanding, their means of nourishment, um, and so on, their gods was clearly Scandinavian, but half of their DNA was British. And I thought that was a great thing. Yeah, can I just throw something there, um, just very quickly? Go on. Obviously at that time with the Vikings, the slave trade, going underlining that as a, a comment of today, um, was actually a major factor in their economy. 
And there would have been no slave trade associated with Inuit. No, absolutely. But um, from going down to, you know, Port of Dublin was a, a slave trade activity for the Vikings. Yeah. Um, therefore, you've got a potential mix of, um, you know, DNA as a result of yeah. that. There's a lot of Irish slaves. Yes. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that is what lots of people are saying today. I, I didn't want to go there today, but I will, on what you've just said, lots of stuff that I'm reading on the internet and I'm not allowed to get involved with any of these conversations. Um, but one thing I'm reading on the internet is that um, lots of people are saying, hang on a minute, you're talking about these people in America and over here, but you're talking about what about uh, a million or so, two million Irish people who are enslaved and people from Wales and all the rest of it. And then you see the debate, slavery is not just confined to them, it's confined to all of us, it's confined to us. And yeah. that is an important point. Anyway, some really important point. I wanna do these images before I close to that last statement. More of these Lewis chess pieces come, carved from uh, walrus ivory. Um, and these end up on the Isle of Lewis and um, there's over a hundred pieces found on the Isle of Lewis by a guy called Mick the, Mr. McTavish. <laughs> Look it up. Um, I want to do this chart, so I'm just going to go on the other ones, archaeological excavation, more archaeological excavations, more of the recent ones on the south, uh, on the south settlement, at um, the east settlement oh, um, in Greenland. Um, this shows some rudimentary workings that there, uh, this is actually the bone, not the ivory, the ivory tusk would have been here. Uh, they're actually carving this as well, so, you know, it was likely that they would have um, exported the raw material rather than the carved material. You don't want to spend time carving something to get to the other end and broken. You sell it to those people and they can take, take the risk. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we do. This is what we say with, 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 with all these types of just sort of trade it in bulk. Um, this thing about kill, killing these walruses, um, to be honest with you, scenes like that, I'm not sure very much to what I've seen. That's high risk. Uh, one of those individuals killed by a, by a walrus would have been quite traumatic to the population. So more in um, coaxing them to do stupid things is more like it. And you've got these wolfhounds uh, that we're talking about. Um, and again, more of these beautiful carvings in ivory and the vessels that, that were not available to them in the 1300. Um, so what we're gonna do now is if we look at this here, and then I'm gonna do, I got my closing statement. Del, keep for the closing statement. So what I wanna do is particularly, we, we've discussed this in detail, um, you know, with what I said earlier on, I'll recap 13, 15, 13, 49, drop in temperature, a mean of about um, one degree, um, technically half a degree, um, and 1989, 2020, an increase in temperature of one degree mean about half. Um, so we've got those parallels there. Um, what we're seeing is that this change is a building change. Um, and then what you then have is my little date here. So what we've got, strangely enough, in Greenland, um, the Ice Age um, isn't... Um, really showing the graphs. We know the mini ice age does begin in 1315 because crops start to fail, but it's not as dramatic. But what is dramatic? There you go, folks. Can you see that there? 1350 again. Everything goes wrong in 1350. And the place de resistance of this graph, before I do my closing statement today, is um, this is. This will show you, um, this will give you a clue, another clue to the collapse of their civilization. So here we go. There it is. At the beginning stages, um, in the bulk <coughs> evidence, um, that it shows that um, their diet doesn't contain, in lots of examples, much in the way of fish. Okay? So for the, for, so between, here we go, around here, just before the 1300s, most of the diet is red meat, okay? Why weren't they eating fish? Superstition, maybe, because in medieval period, 
Lots of people didn't eat fish because of superstition, but it was because they weren't eating fish that would have, uh, that would have been um, catastrophic for their diet. Where the Inuits were eating fish and a mixed diet, they didn't have a mixed diet, okay? Now, later on, what's happening is, what's happening is later on here, you start to see these rises before and after of most of the diet containing large levels of uh, fish rather than red meat. Because around this point, their herds and their flocks are starting to fail. So because they didn't have a mixed diet much earlier, this is going to affect the eventual outcome and this eventual outcome that I keep talking about with 1350. Now, what we're going to do now, I've got my closing statement um, and let's do it. Here we go. And I hope everybody's still with us. I'm not sure, but um, here we go. Not everyone would have left. Some must have stayed on their homesteads, unable to give up old attachments and resolved to wait out their fate. One such stoic was found lying face down on the beach of a fjord in the 1540s, we'll say 1540, by a party of Icelandic seafarers who, like so many sailors before them, had been blown off course on their passage to Iceland and wound up in Greenland. It's a bit of a detour, but it did happen, in this case, in the 1540s. The only Norseman they would come across during their stay was this one individual. This person had died days earlier. He was found face down, dressed in his hood, which dated back to the 1300s. This is something out of a, a weird sort of time machine novel, right? He was found with a hood that dates to the 1300. These guys are, are 240 years later, but this guy that they found on the beach has only just died. He's died a few days earlier. He was dressed in a hood, homespun woolens, and a jacket of seal skins. Nearby his only possession, a bent, a much worn and eaten away iron knife. Moved by their find, they recorded it return home with a knife and I do believe that they actually bury the body. This individual from 1540 was believed to be the last occupant of the Greenland Viking settlements. So with that closing statement, with that great sadness, we're going to stop the screen sharing um, and we've got everybody on the screen. We can only see Jessica's head but don't worry um henry you have you have um what would you like to say would you like to say something no i thought that was really interesting um there's there's a whole list of uh questions that you could go on for a couple of hours after this but i wouldn't do that to you um the clothing one was quite interesting the fact um where people actually handing down clothes from generation to generation because things were spiraling out of control in their economy um, they were obviously sacrificing their their, their resources of uh, cattle sheep etc um, and do they get to the point of one day that actually guys if we don't leave now we're never going to leave and you know what I would I would actually you know um, we've got we've got a doggerland lecture coming up and it's those people isolated on doggerland and they're unable to leave so they can, they've got to leave now or they're just going to drown. Now, this, this, this is that type of thing. This is, this is that type of, this is Robinson Crusoe, right? Um, Robinson Crusoe had an opportunity to leave and he left, you know? Um, so, Anne, would you like to say something? Anne? Which Anne? Oh, <laughs> sensible Anne. <laughs> sensible Anne. Yeah, I must say, I found... I really enjoyed that lecture. I think it had a, a very emotional content to it. Very, 
sad that you know to to think of people living like that i mean all right perhaps from their own lack of understanding things but a really um poignant story thank you thank you really lovely thank you thank you uh, what about you uh dreamy beanie it was fascinating loved thank it you. That, that's good. Uh, we're getting great endorsements, which, um, Del, have you got a comment you'd like to say about? Um, appreciate that. Go on, Del. Del, undo your mics, all of you guys. You've been, you've been undone for a while. Jessica, oh, you're fantastic. allowed to say something. I really appreciated that. That's um, taught me a lot about Greenland, which is somewhere I've looked at for modern days and somewhere I'd like to go, but um, yeah, learnt a lot, especially about that period, but maybe they all went off and uh, discovered oh, America. <laughs> oh, they, they went go to... go in and go in. Hi. They went to South America Hi, with Adolf Hitler. Anyway, Del, I will see you Saturday, okay? Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Um, Bye. To Del. So we've still got Jessica and Anne and Pat. Right, uh, Pat, anything you want to say quick? Well, yes, I remember you saying in your last <laughs> lecture that the ivory trade dried up because the ivory started coming from Africa. And so they didn't have that base to make money. Exactly. Yeah. No, why, why go to, why go to um, Greenland, right? When you could just go along the safe coastline, well, fairly safe, in a flat bottom boat, uh, you know, just sort of avoid the depths of the Bay of Biscay, just go all the way along the coast, fill up your ship full of ivory, just sail all the way back, right? Uh, going along the way, you can, you can yes. stop yes. at all the ports, bring on other supplies and all the rest of it, right? Greenland, my God, it's just open oh, sea over to Greenland. I'm sorry, I'd, I'd do the other one. Um, Anne, um, Anne, you've got um, 45 seconds. You're on the clock to say something. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, it's interesting and uh, scary, really, that a civil, you know, that a country existed for 300 years, or they say 500, but, yeah. you know, it, and then it just disappeared. And, and you know, it, you, can, you can imagine it in this, lifetime you know that the way we treated scotland and you know turned over our forestries to sheep rearing and now we can't afford to buy lamb it's too expensive yeah. you know yeah. I, I i can't buy lamb it's, i think it's just too expensive five pounds just for We've two got plenty pots. of sheep around here <laughs> right okay and i got two goats <laughs> right so uh, so uh, who wanted to chat at the end i was gonna have Where a chat keep it? <laughs> and unfortunately, I need to have a chat with you at the end about publishing, and I want a quick chat with Jessica. So, um, what was I yeah. going to say? Right, who? Are, oh, Jessica, you haven't had your say. Yeah, and um, it reminded me a little bit of Roanoke. Um, Roanoke was a lost colony in America, ah. I believe. And but I feel like it reminds me a little bit of Roanoke, but with more of a twist to it. Um, and the whole evidence of isolation and with them wearing the same clothes from something that was 100 years 50 years out of date even more i think mm -hmm. that's really interesting yeah something obviously there that's really mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. um unique yeah, yeah you know you know you mentioned roanoke and that that's a really good example that would be a great that would be a, a great one for a lecture but uh it would just be having enough information to go on for two hours about that. But, but Ro Roanoke is a really good example where it was just abandoned and uh, we, nobody knows why. Um, so what, what I'm going to say next week, um, which is going to be a very, very... Do you know what? I don't choose these lectures to be topical. That um, It's almost as if I'm doing lectures and something happens and it seems to be relevant. Now, next week, I'm going to be doing the archaeology of the battle of the Somme. Um, if between now and next week um, Germany invades France via <laughs> Belgium, I, uh, I haven't, fault. I've got nothing to do with it, okay? <laughs> I, if it's relevant, right, it's relevant, right, but it's nothing to do with me, okay? 
I, I, I'm on the phone to Adolf Hitler every week, but we're, we're just not going to do that one. Um, right. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, did, did you did you know I, I was um, did you did you know that I I I I had no I, when when Germany invaded Poland, um, the uh, Germans only had twenty two um, divisions um, on the Western Front. And the Allies had over a hundred military divisions. If the Allies had invaded, um, as the Germans had invaded Poland, um, the war would have been over in a few weeks, and the Germans would have lost. Yeah. And people yeah. don't know these little things. In fact, France did invade Ger France did invade Germany, um, but the. Um, but the French general said, oh, we've done enough now. That's OK. Um, we, 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 we've shown them, right? <laughs> and, then, and then a, yeah. a few months later, the Germans invaded France and took it all over. You know, there's, yeah. there's nothing gentlemanly about war. There re yeah. There's really not. Yeah. No. So, so yeah. OK, then, if nobody else has got anything else to say, I'm, I'm going to pass on the love from everybody on and, our and side to... Um, to Drina and Anne. I'm gonna mention that those will be getting a phone call on Monday, but um, I, have, I have sort of, we've had a meeting, a phone calls to all 40 odd people will be ending on a regular basis on the 1st of July, but I'll be speaking to you all uh, on Monday. Um, so uh, the other thing as well is we've got the forum next Wednesday between one and three, three uh, one and two o'clock, everyone gets a link sent to them. We've got Saturday that we're doing the archaeology myth legend things that go bump in the night of my steg. Um, and um, I've got to have a word with Anne about publishing and I have a quick word with Jessica. Anyone got anything else to say before we go? That was great. That was very well, good. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Many thanks. My pleasure. So I'm going to say good night to wonderful Gina. She's always got a smile on her face. Such <laughs> a big smile. I want to give her a big old sloppy kiss. Um, <laughs> And, and Anne, you're wonderful. And as Pat, that American accent really does it for me. And Henry, <laughs> I'll see you soon. Okay, yeah. thank you. Au revoir. Au Bye. revoir, mon petit fleur. Ooh. Mon, mon Bye. fleur. Bye. 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 You, Anne. Anne Bye. Yeah, Bye. Pat, and see you guys. Bye. Right, so we've got Anne and Anne and not, not you, Anne, but the other Anne. Don't get mixed up. Not Anne in Anne. Yeah. Anne's still there. Christine. But. Christine. Uh, yeah, and, 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 no, Anne, I meant the other Anne I need to talk to because you don't have oh. any publishing. No, Hi. no, you're the Hi, one. Anne. Hi, Anne. See you, Anne. Bye. Bye. Oh, I, I haven't got a lot of time because Joe, Joe will be cooking the dinner now and I should be meeting. All right, all right. Any, other, other Anne, I'll see you next week. Yeah. Bye. bye. Okay, bye, Anne. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Right. You can stay there if you like, it don't matter. <laughs>